Well, good morning, South Union. Welcome to each and every one of you. Welcome to all of those who are here with us today. Welcome to all of our regular attenders, our members. Welcome to all of our guests. And to all those listening in online, now or at a later time, welcome. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Our Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus and in the power of your Holy Spirit, we come before your throne of grace. Father God, we thank you so very much for the grace in which we stand. The very blood of Jesus Christ, him crucified and resurrected. We thank you so, so much for the salvation that you have worked through your Son. And Jesus, we thank you so very much that you are seated on the throne of grace, the very throne of God, and that you are ruling your kingdom even now. Father in Jesus, we thank you. We thank you so very much for the most precious gift that you could give us, the gift of your Holy Spirit for all who believe in you. We thank you. Father God, as we lift up our hearts in gratitude to you and for you, and as we praise you, we now humbly ask and we beseech you to give us sustenance for our souls, that you would teach us by your Spirit, through your Word, that we might grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we humbly ask that you would use your Word to teach us, to rebuke us, to correct us, and to train us in righteousness. Father, I beg you, show the transforming power of your word by your spirit in each of our lives. Father God, may this sermon be truthful and clear to those who hear, and helpful, edifying and encouraging to your people. In the strong and precious name do we pray. Amen. What do we do if we struggle with jealousy and envy? How do we handle these dangerous sins and temptations? Today we are going to examine a portion of 1 Samuel 18 and see what happens to Saul fairly quickly after David defeats Goliath, and what we can learn from the biblical text about Saul. I then hope to drive home in some helpful points about handling jealousy and envy in a biblical manner. So let's dive in for our text here today. 1 Samuel chapter 18 is something that is happening immediately after 1 Samuel chapter 17. We know this for two different reasons. Examine the text with me. Look at the key words in verse 1. It says, as soon as he finished speaking to Saul. That's connecting us back immediately to the previous chapter in which we find... David talking to Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 57 and 58. That's talking about the defeat of Goliath at the hands of David. It says, as soon as David returned from the striking down of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant Jesse the Bethlehemite. As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul. Okay. Verse 6 actually also continues on in that immediate context. As they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistines, Again, that's talking about Goliath. And so all of chapter 18 is happening really immediately after those events. Which means as we examine our text for today, 1 Samuel chapter 18 verses 1 through 4 are describing events immediately afterwards. 
Verse 5 is a summary context that looks backwards from a future point, okay, to round out the story of David. And then verse 6 again bounces back immediately after Goliath and continues on. This is important to see because it's sometimes easy to lose track of things, and we think that there might be some distance in events. There is not. All of these things are happening soon, immediately, right after Goliath. And what we find then is that David is quickly cultivating the favor of everyone around him and everyone around Saul as their circles intertwine. Take a look at this, verse 1. As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Verse 2. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. So there's this context where Jonathan loves David. Saul, he sees David's value and immediately brings him in and does not let him part from his house. And then take a look at this in verse 3. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. Now that's not happening in private. That's happening in front of Saul and in front of Abner, both of whom are in the tent when David is talking to Saul. Jonathan is also there, the text implies, and immediately does these actions. Notice here that there is no words about how David, quote-unquote, feels about Jonathan. Why? It's totally irrelevant for the text. What's happening here is Jonathan is swearing, is making a covenant of loyalty to David. It's a one-way street. Jonathan is saying that he is the vassal and David is the superior, that Jonathan is the lesser and he's swearing loyalty to David. Jonathan then invites him in the household and basically says, you are taking my place in line for the throne by stripping all of his equipment and his very robe off himself and dressing David in them. That is a symbolic act, giving over his throne, his place in line for the throne to David. And David, uh, in verse 5, then we see that David also cultivates favor with all of Israel. Now, Saul's not like thinking, his, his headlights, his, his alarm bells are not up quite yet. But then in verse 6 and 7, what we see is Saul's alarm bells suddenly start flashing. And he's saying, hey, actually, this man has something that I do not. This man is getting something that I don't have. And it strikes in him both jealousy and envy. As they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, and with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated, Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Now remember, this event is immediately after Goliath. How many people has David killed at this point? One. He's killed Goliath. How many people has Saul killed? Well, he's been in a few wars, probably quite a few. Has it been thousands? So what's the point of the text? The point of the text is to assign honor to these victories, 
to this specific victory and to the champions who won it. And notice that even though this man really didn't do anything in the previous narrative, he still receives the position of honor. Saul is listed first and is attributed thousands to his Uh, to to his uh, victories, to, to the amount of people he's beaten in battle. And David then is assigned the second place, but assigned the greater number, ten thousands. And Saul becomes angry because the saying displeased him. And notice here that in his anger, in his burgeoning jealousy, in the beginning of his envy, Saul finally sees something clearly. You notice that? Look at this. He says this. What more can he have but the kingdom? Well, actually, that's going to be David's too, isn't it? And Saul does see that point, although from the wrong perspective. Notice here, verse 9, Saul eyed David from that day on. Verse 10, look at the time stamp of this thing. Verse 10, the next day. Have you ever joined a job, had a job position, and you're like really excited for it, and the first day of work after your interview, you're walking in and the boss goes crazy? That's this situation. David has the interview. He's beaten Goliath. He's now gone home. The next day, things turn for the worse. The next day, a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul, and he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre, as he did day by day. Saul had his spear in his hand, and Saul hurled the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. This is the result of envy and jealousy. He attempts to murder David. But do you see the text? David evaded him twice. Now, isn't that amazing? I mean, Saul immediately attributes that to the Lord's presence. Look here in verse 12. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him but had departed from Saul. Notice that Saul has lost something and David has gained something which Saul does not have. But you know, if this was me, after the first time somebody throws a spear at me, I might start playing my lyre like in the doorway or heading out the door. David sticks in there and evades the spear twice. Saul then removes him from his presence but does the very thing that will build David's fame. He makes him a commander. David is successful. All Israel loved David. But Saul was in fearful awe of him. Verse 15. So what then do we learn from this text? I mean, it's an interesting text, but what do we we gain from it? Here's the thing. As Christians... We need to understand the roles of jealousy and envy within our lives because that is what Saul is experiencing and dealing with. Uh, These definitions that I'm going to be using are from a book uh, written by Rebecca D. Young. They're called, called Glittering Vices. And she says this as a helpful way of parsing them out. Jealousy is having something or someone that the jealous owner does not want to lose. So this is jealousy is primarily about the fear of loss. Saul here is struggling with jealousy. Why? He does not want to lose the throne to David. He has something and does not want to lose it. Coveting is something different. Saul's not struggling with this. Coveting is wanting something, i.e. a possession. It is specifically a thing that someone else has. 
What's an example? Somebody might covet the BMW that somebody else is dri driving. Oh, I would just do anything to be able to drive that BMW, right? That would be an instance of coveting. We're not going to deal with coveting today because Saul is not, doesn't, doesn't struggle with it, so we'll have to save that for another time. Envy, however, is not having an internal quality or a symbol of that quality and wanting to deny another person that quality. Usually the envious person knows that they can't have it. Why? It's an internal quality they do not have. What's this talking about? What's an example? Here's the example from the text. Saul knows that the Lord is not with him. Saul knows David has the Lord on his side. Saul wants to deprive David of that and throws his spear at him to pin him to the wall. Twice. Okay? Saul is envious. He doesn't have the internal quality of the Lord's, of the relationship with the Lord that David has. Now, here's the thing. Many people will say, well, actually, these aren't really visible sins, necessarily. These are things that many people can hide. They deal with under the surface. Why is this a big deal to, to deal with? Here's the thing. Um, jealousy and envy are listed in the list of fleshly sins in Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. And you can turn there if you want. I will read them for us very quickly. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21, it reads like this. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, riv rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Listen to these words of warning. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, that's a stern warning. And so we are about, we, we must be about uprooting these things as there are, if there are a temporary struggle or an ongoing struggle, we must be about uprooting them. Why? Well, all the sins of the flesh, but especially envy and jealousy, reveal deep-seated rebellion against God. Why? They reveal rebellion against the designs of God, and they reveal a lack of trust in God to provide. Finally, these sins do warp our view of the world. So let's take a look at these one at a time. Jealousy. Jealousy is clinging to something or someone so tightly with a desperate fear of losing it. For Saul, he does not want to lose the throne. For us, it may be that we don't want to lose our job position. And we're jealous of a rival coming up the ranks and succeeding. Or maybe it's we're jealous over our spouse. And we don't want to lose them, and so we're clutching on to them, but we look on jealousy with any potential rival or supposed rival to our position as spouse. The root problem, then, is fear of loss. One more time, the root problem is the fear of loss. How do we resolve that problem? Well, for Saul, submission to God's ruling 
Beginning to truly worship and trust in God would be the cure. Right? That would actually be the cure for Saul's issue. For us, the remedy is the same. We must begin with submitting to God's ruling. Here's the thing, if we are to lose our job position to someone who is more successful or better than us, then we are going to, perhaps, lose that job position. We may very well lose the thing that we are afraid of losing. And we must submit to the rule of God in that. Now, I want to say that, and then I want to say this other bit. We have to use common sense when I'm applying this remedy. This does not mean, well, now I'm going to become apathetic and totally do nothing. No, no, that's not right either. We must act rightly and righteously in every position that we have. So let me specifically talk about that spouse position or that marriage. What does it mean if, if we're jealous of our spa, for our spouse, and we're jealous of other people, we're afraid of losing our spouse, the answer is not, well, I'm going to submit to God's ruling and let these rivals take my place. No, no. The answer is, I'm going to submit to God's rule, but I'm also going to act righteously with my spouse, and I'm going to maybe go to counseling if needed. And I'm going to date my spouse and show love to my spouse and do those things that are right and necessary and proper in that relationship. With our jobs, if we see somebody more successful than us coming on up, then what do we do? Well, we, we are submitting to God's ruling. We're not going to act out of jealousy, but maybe we do take some extra job training to become better at our position. Why? So, well, there, there's no point in lay, simply laying down what we have. Saul is not asked to immediately um, give up the throne to David. You will not find that in the text. He is not asked to do that. But he could certainly improve in his kingship by having a relationship with God. So we must submit to God's ruling but we also must act righteously or rightly within the course of our life. Number two, we also must then truly worship God as God. One of the issues with jealousy is, again, the fear of loss. And part of the grabbing hold and control of that is to say, I want the position of God to dictate what happens in my life, and that I shall not lose this. Instead, we must worship God as sovereign. God, you are on the throne. Yes, I will submit to your rule. Yes, I will live rightly within the circumstances provided. And... I must worship God on the throne. And third, we must trust God that all things will work out for good. Why? For those who love God, God is in control. So how do we do these things? What, 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 what's, the, what's the task? First, resolve ourselves that if something is to be lost by God's design, then it is indeed lost. Even as we work rightly and righteously in whatever situation that we find ourselves, we must still live rightly and resolve God. His rule will be what, what is. Two, um, actually, that's, that's the only point. Oh, here it is, too. Trust in the Lord, especially if the loss causes suffering. 1 Peter 4, 19. And third, trust God will bring forth good from the loss. Fourth, submit to God 
in the circumstance while crying out for mercy. If we are jealous and if we are afraid of loss, we cannot act out of that jealousy, but we must also go to the one who has power to transform our lives. Pray, plead for the mercy of the Lord. That's jealousy. Next, envy. The root problem with envy, according to de Young, is actually comparative self-value. Now, what in the world does that mean? Let me remind us, there is a difference between jealousy and envy. Envy is wanting to deny another person an internal quality we do not have. Okay, So envy, for Saul, how does that work out? Saul does not have a relationship with the Lord. He wants to deny David his relationship with, by putting a spear through his chest. Okay? That is envy. Why? Saul, who is considered as little in his own eyes when he is rebuked by Samuel in chapter 15, he is little in his own eyes. Saul is comparing himself to David and finding that indeed he has a lack. Therefore, he is worth less than David. I've only killed thousands, but to David they attributed ten thousands. What's wrong there? It's the comparison and the self-worth derived from that comparison. So what's the remedy The remedy is find contentment and gratitude for the person and position in life God has made us and brought us to. We are to find our worth in Jesus Christ, not in ourselves or anything else. So we find contentment. How do we do that? First, Worship God and give thanks to Him for everything, including ourselves and including the situations we find ourselves in. Give thanks for everything. Well, wait a second, that can be hard, can it? What do you mean? I'm giving thanks to God in the midst of my illness and in the midst of my suffering, in the midst of my pain, in the midst of my loss, while so-and-so over there gets to be joyful and happy all the time. Oh, how I hate that person for being so happy. Anybody ever felt like that? You walk into work, the person has a huge smile on their face, and you're just like, I hate smiles in the morning. Nobody should be that happy on Monday morning. Right? The comparing that is making us feel less than for something the other person has. Oh, envy can play on us and almost want us to destroy the other person. So what do we do? Cultivate gratitude and thankfulness for every situation we are in. Period. Thank you, Father. Second, cultivate contentment. Contentment is a tremendous and an extremely important part of the Christian life. I would say be content in almost everything except holiness. Almost every, with holiness, with a drive to live holy, we should always live in a holy discontent with our holiness. We always want to pursue becoming more like Jesus. But for everything else, contentment is a tremendous part of the Christian life. Why? Contentment reveals that we are, that, that we are satisfied with what God has designed for our good. Contentment, design, Uh, it's happiness, it's joy in what God has designed for our good. 
You know, it's amazing as we think about our own lives and as we think about the course of our lives and the process of our lives, that we should maybe study the book of Jeremiah a bit more. Listen to these words from Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 23 and 24. Look at how Jeremiah phrases this. He says this, I know, O Lord, that the way of man is not in himself, that it is not in man who walks to direct his steps. I'm in control of my life. Jeremiah would be like, uh-uh. No, you're, you may be walking, but your steps are directed by one who places the steps in front of you that you walk. And look then in verse 24, how Jeremiah cries out to the Lord. He says this, Correct me, O Lord, but in justice, not in your anger, lest you bring me to nothing. Out of all the prophets, Jeremiah, I think, is, is one of those prophets that, is, that struggles with his place the most. He prophesies for 23 years before the judgment that he predicts comes. He feels every day shame over prophesying the same thing of destruction and not seeing it come about for 23 years. Jeremiah is not allowed to have a wife or children. God specifically forbids him to do it. Jeremiah is put in stocks for proclaiming the word of the Lord. He's tossed about and made fun of. He's, uh, he's forbidden from entering the temple. He's thrown into a cistern even during the siege. When the judgment that he prophesies finally comes out, he is awarded with being arrested and then thrown into an empty dirt cistern filled with mud. Mm -hmm. The Bible's a little bit more real about what that mud is. It's, it's feces, right? And what does Jeremiah say? Correct me, O Lord, but in justice, not in your anger, lest you bring me to nothing. What's he looking for there? Contentment. Oh, we are to cultivate contentment in our lives. Finally, Stop the game of comparing ourselves to others in order to find our worth. Stop comparing ourselves with others. We do this so often, and especially in American culture, that I want to dwell on it just a little bit. You know, we have, um, does anybody here like football? You don't have to raise your hands, just nod your heads. Does anybody like football? It's amazing how much self-worth put, people put into football. Like as if they, when their team wins the championship, that they themselves are escalated with them into a position of champions. And if they dare to lose a game, just how awful everything and everyone is on the team and how rank the coach is and how dare they and I could have played that better than them and oh, if I was just in the game. And then here comes the glory days of our high school sports and whatever else the game. Why is all this self-worth and attention put into a game? And that's just about games. And then we have life. Everyone comparing salaries. Everyone comparing, oh, that person can afford that sort of house. And that person, that sort of car. And then we say these words, where did that person get that sort of money? Why? Instead, if we are to compare ourselves to anything, we should compare ourselves not to any person, but to the law of God. If we know ourselves, if we have truly looked inward, then we know that we are grave sinners who are indeed not worthy. We have broken God's law. 
perhaps worshiping another god or activity, perhaps making graven images, perhaps taking the Lord's name in vain, certainly breaking the Sabbath in our current culture, perhaps dishonoring our parents, perhaps murder or anger at a sibling or friend, adultery or lust in the heart, covetousness, bearing false witness or lying, being jealous or envious, or any of the innumerable other sins that we commit. When it comes to the most important thing about a human being, we find we are all at the same plane and on the same level. We all have all failed miserably, being found sinners, rebels, and transgressors against God's laws. That God gives us worth. For God so loved the world that he gave his unique son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Jesus Christ came and bore the penalty of our sin, took our iniquities upon himself, bore the wrath of God, became the spotless sacrifice, and shed his blood on the cross to make atonement for our sin. We know that Jesus Christ rose again on the third day, vindicated by God, a physical resurrection, such that Jesus will never die again. He is ascended, seated at the right hand of God. When we come to Jesus, when we believe in him as our Lord and Savior, when we entrust him with our whole lives and every part of it, when we, out of gratitude and faith, commit to following the ways of Jesus, then we will be saved and experience the fullness of God's love in Jesus Christ. This is a gift of God by grace through faith when we are born again, when we are new creations, then we are able to live in contentment. Why? We have him. We are able to submit to God's will in life and in his word. Why? We have him. And we're able to live lives free of jealousy and envy. Why? We have the greatest treasure ever given to man, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so very much for you and for your love. Lord Jesus, we just pray a special blessing upon anyone who struggles with jealousy or envy here today. We pray that you would uproot that from their lives, that you would help them to find the fullness of contentment in life in Jesus Christ. Father God, for any who don't struggle with jealousy or envy, but struggle with some other sin. We just pray, Lord Jesus, a special blessing upon them that you would uproot that sin from their life and give them the victory found in Jesus Christ alone. Father, work on us, please. We beg you. Give us a greater measure of your Holy Spirit. Transform us by the power of your word. In the strong and mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.